joining us and welcome to today's program entitled TC Heartland, a deep dive into next level issues for companies in an integrated economy. Before I turn the program over to our presenters today, I would like to go over just a few housekeeping items with everyone. Today's program will last approximately 60 minutes. We do encourage you to submit written questions throughout the program, so please type your question into the Q&A widget, which is open on the left-hand side of your screen. We will respond to the written questions at the end of the program, time permitting, and should we run out of time to address all of the questions, we will certainly follow up with everyone directly following the program. The webcast console you're looking at can be completely customized. You can resize or move any of the windows that you do have open including maximizing the PowerPoint presentation on your screen. If you experience technical difficulties at any point during the presentation, please visit the webcast help guide by clicking on the help button below the presentation window, which is designated with the question mark icon. Additionally, a PDF copy of today's presentation slides is available for immediate download via the resource list widget open on the left-hand side of your screen. This PDF and an audio recording of today's presentation will also be available for download from our website, which is www.foley.com, within the next few business days. And as a final note, at the conclusion of the program, a survey will appear on your screen. We ask that you please take a minute or two and provide your feedback about today's presentation. Your feedback is very important to us, and it will help us shape our programs going forward. Thank you so much, and with that, I will turn it over to our presenters today. Okay, thanks so much, and uh, thanks to all the attendees, uh, those uh, whether on the East Coast or the West Coast or in between in the U.S., and uh, thanks as well to our participant, participants in Asia. Happy Friday to each of you, and, and hope that you enjoy this presentation. Uh, you see the roadmap there that we've got on the screen. We're going to go talk a little bit about the background and how venue fits into the overall structure, uh, what the main issues are post TC Heartland, and talk a little bit about some strategies that patent owners may uh, attempt to have to seek favorable venue and then some potential countermeasures. We'll talk uh, a little bit of specifics, specifics as well with respect to TC Heartland's impact or potential impact on the pharma industry, both uh, Hatch Waxman and Biosimilars. Before we get into the presentation, why don't I give you a brief introduction of our presenting team. Um, with me here in D.C. is uh, Leanne Peterson. Leanne is a vice chair of our IP litigation group. Um, she focuses a lot in complex litigation in pharma and biotech fields, focusing uh, primarily in Hatch-Waxman cases. She also leverages her experience as a former law clerk at the U.S. International Trade Commission uh, to uh, lead a number of our ITC cases. Uh, next, Kevin Mullaney is a senior associate in our Milwaukee office, also in our IP litigation group and he's got a very strong background in software, handling a number of software and hardware disputes, uh, handles some specialized issues such as standard setting organization issues, post-grant proceedings, and the like. And my name is Pavan Agarwal. I'm a partner here in D.C. I'm here to support uh, Leanne and Kevin. My practice, uh, somewhat similar to Kevin's, is in the high-tech field with a focus on automotive and communications technologies. So with that, why don't I turn it over to Kevin uh, to get us started on the background of venue uh, in patent cases in TC Heartland overall. Thanks, Pavan. Uh, as Pavan mentioned, the first thing we're going to cover is a little bit of background on venue and patent cases, and also just uh, talk a little bit about the TC Heartland decision itself before we launch into um, the impact of the Heartland decision on both uh, pending cases and cases that are yet to be filed. So. The first point I'd like to make is that um, venue is not the same as personal jurisdiction. There are two separate legal requirements that must be met in order for uh, the case in that venue to proceed. Um, there are overlaps between personal jurisdiction and venue, certainly. Certainly, uh, the facts supporting um, both personal jurisdiction and venue are related in many cases. Uh, and we will talk about personal jurisdiction uh, sp specifically in the context of foreign corporations in, uh, in patent cases. Um, but TC Heartland itself dealt with uh, the venue aspects and the venue requirements of the cases. Um, and venue uh, is controlled by statute. Uh, and in patent cases, there's a specific venue statute, uh, 28 U.S.C. 1400, 
uh, and it states any civil action for patent infringement may be brought in the judicial district where the defendant resides, so that's the first choice. Uh, and then the second choice is or where the defendant has committed acts of infringement and has a regular and established place of business. Um, in, in 1957, the uh, Supreme Court interpreted this statute in the Four Co. Glass case, uh, and that, that case will, will come up in our discussions of both the Federal Circuit's V.E. Holding case and the Supreme Court's T.C. Hartland case. Um, but in Four Co., uh, it um, set forth the definition of resides uh, for the purposes of 28 U.S.C. 1400, uh, and it determined that for the purposes of venue under 1400, a domestic corporation resides only in its state of incorporation. So um, sort of combining the Forco decision into the statute itself, after Forco, venue is proper over a domestic corporation in patent cases, uh, one, in its state of incorporation, or uh, two, where it committed acts of infringement and has a regular and established place of business. Um, subsequent to Forco, uh, the general venue statute, which is 28 U.S.C. 1391, uh, was amended. And these amendments um, really broadened uh, at least the language of 1391, the general venue statute, um, such that it brought into question uh, the um, impact or influence that 1391 had over more specific um, uh, venue statutes, such as 1400. Um, on this slide, I have the current version of 1391, um, but you can see, at least in the, uh, especially in the current version, um, it does have broad language. For example, applicability of section, this section shall govern the venue of all civil actions brought in district courts of the United States. And if you look down at uh, 1391C, residency for all venue purposes. So very um, broad language that raised questions um, as to whether 1391 was meant to um, obviate the more specific venue statutes uh, or whether uh, the, the, the holding such as that set forth in Forco um, was still good law uh, with the more specific patent venue statute. Um, so the... Federal Circuit, uh, so I should mention that 1391, uh, these broadening amendments were added in 1988. Um, so in 1990, the Federal Circuit uh, considered this very question um, in the VE Holding uh, uh, Corporation case, uh, and it determined that the amendments um, to 1391 made by Congress included uh, classic incorporation language um, for purposes of venue under this chapter. Uh, and to the Federal Circuit, this meant that uh, 1391 was uh, intended to modify venue in patent cases, uh, and thus uh, it sort of rendered the uh, narrower um, venue uh, requirements of 1400 um, you know, meaningless because the more, the broader, um, the more general um, 1391 residency requirements controlled in patent cases after VE holding. So, uh, in other words, after the VE holding case of the Federal Circuit, district courts really conflated the venue inquiry uh, with the personal jurisdiction inquiry such that they were uh, one and the same. Uh, in other words, if there was personal jurisdiction over a defendant uh, in a particular forum, that also meant under 1391 uh, C2 that uh, that defendant also resided in that forum for the purposes of venue. Uh, so really after V holding, venue in patent cases uh, became a nullity or became coterminous with the personal uh, jurisdiction uh, determination. So although uh, multiple uh, petitions for, for cert were, were filed over the years after V holding, um, the Supreme Court finally granted cert uh, this past fall in 2016 uh, on, this, on this very question as to uh, the, the sort of conflict between the VE holding decision and the Supreme Court's precedent in Forco. Uh, and the, the Supreme Court um, it recently issued, I think three weeks ago at this point, issued the TC Heartland decision. Which, is, which reversed the Federal Circuit's longstanding V holding decision and reinstated the narrower residency definition set forth in Forco. Uh, in essence, the, the, the Supreme Court and the T.C. Heartland decision said that Forco was still good law, that V holding could not um, overturn uh, for, uh, Forco as V holding was a Federal Circuit case, uh, and that 1391 
the residency requirements put forth in 1391 were not meant to affect uh, venue in patent cases. So really, uh, TC Heartland uh, reaffirms FORCO uh, and reinstates uh, the original um, venue requirements that were set forth in FORCO. Um, and, and really, it's as if the VE holding uh, decision never occurred. Uh, so after TC Heartland, as to domestic corporations, we'll cover foreign corporations in a minute, but as to dom domestic corporations, um, venue in a patent case is proper if the venue is one in the state where the company, where the defendant company is incorporated, or acts of infringement occurred in the forum and the company has a regular and established place of business. Um, so as a result of TC Heartland, I, I think it, it, at least in our minds, it brought to brought to the front three immediate questions. One, there's a lot of patent cases that are that are currently pending throughout the country um, that in in which the defendants might now have venue defenses. How does TC Heartland affect those pending cases? Um, and the next question that comes to mind is, what constitutes a regular and established place of business under uh, 1400B? Um, because of the VE holding decision by the Federal Circuit, this aspect of 1400B really became irrelevant because the entire determination of venue was conflated with personal jurisdiction. So this is uh, in, an aspect uh, of 1400B that has not been litigated for some time. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it falls upon courts to um, re reanalyze this question, um, and it, it'll, it'll be, I think, an aspect of 1400B that's going to get a lot of coverage over the next three to six months. Uh, so next, I want to take a look at uh, how we think the uh, TC Heartland impact will impact not only pending cases, but also cases that haven't been filed yet. So I'd like to focus first on pending cases uh, and look at the hurdles that current patent defendants will face uh, as they are trying to uh, apply the TC Heartland venue requirements to their currently pending cases. Uh, and the two uh, legal hurdles uh, that litigants will have to overcome in order to uh, apply TC Heartland to their cases is, one, is the law retroactively applicable to pending cases? Uh, and as we'll see in the next slide, I think the, the answer to that question is yes, uh, based on the Supreme Court precedent. Uh, and I th but I think the, the more difficult question, the more interesting question will be, um, have defendants who are past the pleading stage that may not have raised venue defenses in the first instance Will they be able to, or have they waived their venue defenses? Will they be, will they be able to reassert those defenses, or will courts uh, hold that they've lost them and they can't uh, assert them because they've already waived those defenses? So the first question, is T.C. Heartland uh, retroactively applicable to pending cases? Uh, I think there's strong Supreme Court precedent that indicates that, yes, the, the general rule as to retroactivity of judicial decisions uh, is that it, they, they are retroactively applicable. Uh, and that, that rule is set forth in the Harper case from 1993. that states, when this court applies a rule of federal law to the parties before it, that rule is the controlling interpretation of federal law and must be given full retroactive effect in all cases still open on direct review, and as to all events, regardless of whether such events predate or postdate the announcement of the rule. And on this, on this slide, I, I included a, a few um, circumstances uh, in which the Federal Circuit uh, relies on Harper and applies subsequent uh, legal decisions uh, to our repending cases. Uh, and if you look at the quote from the Heartland case, the general rule is that judicial decisions are retroactive. Uh, I think that's, that's kind of it in a nutshell. And I, I, I don't think that courts um, will have much trouble applying T.C. Heartland retroactively going forward. Um, as I alluded to before, I think the more interesting question is whether defendants have waived uh, their improper venue defenses. Um, First, to, just to cover waiver generally, under the Federal Rule of Civil Procedure 12, there are certain defenses uh, available to defendants uh, that are personal to those defendants, uh, and th but that are waivable under the federal rules. Uh, venue is one such defense. Personal jur jurisdiction is another defense. Uh, service of process is another defense. But uh, under the rules of, uh, of uh, 12H1, those defenses are waivable. Uh, in other words, if you don't raise those defenses at the outset of the case, 
you can lose those defenses for the entire case. Um, and there are numerous uh, circuits and decisions uh, throughout the country that hold that the de determination of waiver is within the discretion of the trial court. Um, so it's something that uh, is on a case-by-case -case basis um, that will be determined um, sort of by the trial courts in the first instance and won't be disturbed uh, on appeal unless there's, you know, an abusive discretion. Um, so the first question to answer is as to whether it, uh, improper venue defense based on TC Heartland will be available to defendants is whether they waive the, the defense in the first place. Um, if they haven't waived the defense, they, they'll face no hurdle um, in, in, in reasserting that defense uh, after TC Heartland. Um, but if, if we look at how a defendant uh, waives a particular defense, um, we can, we can look at some situations in which defendants have waived the defense and figure out if that applies in your particular case. Um, the first most obvious uh, way of waiver is set forth in the federal rules itself. Um, by the express terms of 12H1, if a defendant does not challenge venue in its first responsive pleading, then that defense is waived. Uh, in other words, if a, excuse me, if a defendant files a Rule 12 motion, like motion to dismiss for failure to state a claim or uh, a lack of personal jurisdiction, but fails to assert the improper venue defense, then that defense is waived uh, and that, that defense is gone unless there's an exception uh, to the doctrine of waiver, which we'll discuss next. There are certain circumstances in which uh, there are exceptions to the doctrine of waiver. Um, uh, as an alternative example, if a defendant files an answer that does not include uh, a waivable defense such as venue, then that defendant has waived uh, that defense unless there's an exception that applies. Uh, what we also see is even if the defense is raised in an answer, uh, a defendant can waive uh, a venue defense or a waivable defense uh, on the basis of its uh, conduct. So if it's dilatory about raising that defense, if it's not diligent about filing a motion on that waivable defense, then that defendant's conduct can also waive the defense. So uh, there's a case, two cases here, exemplary cases from the Ninth Circuit. Uh, one, more generally, the Peterson case that just holds that Rule 12 defenses may be waived as a result of the course of conduct pursued by a party during litigation. Uh, and then also the Word Tech case, which, which really stands for the same proposition. So if a defendant, say, answers you know, three years ago, challenges venue, but then doesn't do anything about it for three years, then that conduct could be deemed a waiver. And this is really where... Um, the discretion of the trial court comes into play because the trial court is going to be tasked with looking at that conduct and determining whether that conduct was egregious enough to work a waiver of that defense that they attempted to preserve. But as I said before, even if there is a waiver of the improper venue defense, there may be a way that defendants are still able to assert this defense uh, under what's called an intervening change in the law exception to the rule of waiver. Um, and there's three cases here for Second Circuit, Fourth Circuit, and a more general case from the Supreme Court that all st stand for the same proposition, namely that you can't waive something you didn't have, uh, with the thinking being that if there's an intervening change in the law, that gives you a defense that you didn't have before, then you couldn't have waived that defense because you couldn't have asserted it before. Uh, and that's, that's, that's really the principle that's being um, set forth by the exemplary cases uh, on, this, on this page. And you can see the Supreme Court in Curtis v. Butts, an effective waiver must be one of a known right or privilege. So if there's an intervening change in the law that gives you that right or privilege, you couldn't have waived it to begin with. And there's a 1995 case, uh, Engel versus uh, CBS, uh, which specifically addresses the intervening law exception in the context uh, of a change in the venue law. Uh, in the Engel case, the complaint was filed in 1985, and the venue was proper uh, in, under the existing statute at the time. Uh, 1391 was subsequently amended, uh, which, which gave, which uh, 
gave the defendant in that case uh, an improper venue argument. Um, the plaintiff argued that the defendant waived that defense uh, because they didn't raise it at the outset of the case, uh, but the court disagreed, and they applied the intervening law exception um, because the defendants uh, cannot be faulted for not having raised a defense that they did not know was available to them. Now, I, I distinguish Engel a little bit from our present situation because Engel was an express change uh, in the statutory law that was in place at the time. So um, I, I think that's distinguishable from the T.C. Hartland case, which was uh, merely uh, interpreting judicial decisions, uh, but basically using the same body of venue statutes to reach its result. So really, I think the question of waiver, there are arguments um, both in favor and against whether the T.C. Heartland decision was a change in the law sufficient to trigger uh, an exception to waiver. Uh, on the yes side, uh, I think it's a, it's a pretty um, rational story to say that V holding was a decision of the federal court, which was binding on the district court, uh, and that was the law of the land for 27 years. It was decided in 1990. It wasn't until this year, 2017, um, that T.C. Heartland was handed down. Um, as such, uh, district courts were applying the broader uh, residency requirements of 1391 consistently based on instruction from the Federal Circuit. Um, T.C. Heartland opinion said, no, that's incorrect. V holding is wrongly decided. Um, Forco uh, is is good law. Forco is what district courts should be applying, and 1400B is the controlling statute uh, for venue and patent cases. I, I think, based on that set of facts, I, I think it's a reasonable argument that this was an intervening change in the law, um, such that defendants in in district court cases didn't have this defense predicated on um, T.C. Heartland. Uh, at the time complaints were filed, uh, and so it should not work a waiver uh, of the venue defense um, in those cases because this is an exception to the waiver law. On the other side, uh, and I alluded to this argument a few minutes ago uh, when I was discussing the Engel case, um, the Supreme Court um, in T.C. Heartland uh, is basically just reaffirming Forco. Uh, they said that Forco you know, was good law before V holding, V holding being a federal circuit decision um, could not affect the Forco Supreme President. Therefore, Forco has uh, always been good law, and litigants always had Forco uh, available to them to assert in their cases uh, that there was improper venue. Uh, and in fact, the T.C. Heartland defendants uh, did just that. They argued on the basis of Forco um, that the uh, uh, venue was not proper uh, in that district, uh, and therefore T.C. Heartland is not a change in the law. Uh, instead, it's just an interpretation uh, of what the law was, um, and that Forco um, was good law before V.E. Holding, was good law after V.E. Holding, uh, so that does not reflect a change in the law. So that's the argument on the other side uh, of whether there's been an intervening law sufficient to trigger um, the uh, exception to the waiver doctrine. There's been one uh, district court case which has answered this question, uh, and they uh, answered it in the negative, in the sense that uh, they took the view, and this is Judge Morgan from the Eastern District of Virginia, took the view that T.C. Heartland was not a change in the law, uh, because all it did was merely uh, reaffirm that Forco uh, was good law, and that it is it's always been available to defendants in patent cases, um, regardless of the Federal Circuit's VE holding. Uh, and therefore, because it did not change the law, there is not an exception to the waiver doctrine. Uh, and therefore, the defendants in the Cobalt Boats case waived their improper venue defense. Uh, and as such, um, he denied uh, the motion um, to uh, dismiss on the basis of T.C. Heartland. I, I think there's a few things about the um, Cobalt Boats decision which are worth mentioning. I think the most important thing to mention was the case was on the eve of trial. Uh, and in fact, is in trial this week, I believe. Um, and I think this is important to note because although the court's opinion itself does not mention um, the fact that it is on the eve of trial, uh, it's hard to imagine that that did not 
um, influence the court who had obviously the litigants had put in a lot of time in free trial. The court had done a lot of work to get this thing ready for trial. Um, it, it did not seem like, uh, he wanted to get rid of the case, uh, at this 11th hour. Um, so I, I would imagine that had some influence on this decision. Um, what's also interesting is that the, uh, defendants in the cobalt boats case filed a petition for mandamus to the federal circuit. Uh, a split panel of the Federal Circuit denied the petition late last week. Uh, what's notable about the denial is that uh, Judge Newman wrote a dissent in the case, uh, and I think it's interesting that she remarked that there was little doubt uh, that T.C. Heartland was a change in the law of venue. Um, so it's pretty clear that Judge Newman disagreed with uh, Judge Morgan uh, on this, uh, in this respect, um, and that she viewed T.C. Heartland as a change in the law of venue. Uh, which would have uh, resulted in a different determination of whether there was an exception to the waiver doctrine. Um, it, it was also notice, uh, interesting that perhaps anticipating arguments that, you know, EVA trial should not be um, dismissing cases on the basis of venue, Judge Newman also noted that the venue statute and the venue requirements um, were critical to to trial. And she commented that it is at trial that the purposes and policy of proper venue become dominant. So uh, I think Judge Newman is sort of anticipating uh, arguments that, you know, if cases are to a sufficient point, we shouldn't be dismissing on the basis of venue. So that's, that's all for waiver. I did want to say a little bit about um, the regular and established place of business aspects of 1400B. Um, as I alluded to before, um, this aspect of 1400B has not been litigated since before VE holding. Um, so it's been 27 years since um, this aspect of 1400B has really been uh, at issue in cases. Um, obviously, uh, the way companies do business, the economy, um, the technology has taken a huge step forward, and corporations do business very differently uh, in 2017 than they do in 1990. Um, so it'll be very interesting um, over the next, you know, three to six months to a year to see how courts come out on this question. Um, even looking at the pre-VE holding case law um, that dealt with regular and established place of business at that time, uh, it's interesting because uh, it's clear from the cases that the determinations are very, very fact-intensive. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, if you read one case and then it goes one way and then you read another case on a very similar set of facts, it's not uncommon to see different courts treat the same set of facts uh, very differently. Um, so it's a very fact-intensive um, uh, inquiry, um, and it'll be interesting to see um, sort of what direction this regular and established place of business goes in the next, uh, next three to six months to a year. Although it's, it's, I don't think it's um, terribly useful to go through um, all of the examples I have in this presentation, I think it is worth mentioning two such decisions. Uh, one is uh, in recordis, uh, which is the most recent um, uh, treatment of regular and established place of business by the Federal Circuit. This is from 1985. Um, so because it's from the Federal Circuit, I expect it will be cited extensively. Uh, in motion practice here coming up um, with motions based on T.C. Heartland. Uh, and I think the interesting aspect of Cordis is that it, it really encourages a flexible approach that looks at the actual business activity that's happening in a forum and goes beyond what merely whether the, the corporation in question has a brick-and-mortar physical presence in the forum. Uh, and the quote from Cordis, I think, that drives this home is, is listed on this slide. Um, on, its, on its facts itself, the panel held that two full-time sales reps with supplies and support, such as company-owned cars and administrative staff, constituted a regular and established place of business. So really, it looked beyond whether there was uh, an, an, an office in the district, which there was not in this case, and looked at the business, the nature of the contacts and nature of the business practices to, deter, to determine whether there was a regular and established place of business. The other case I think is worth mentioning is the Hemstreet case. It's a district court case from the Northern District of Illinois from 1990. Although Hemstreet is a district court case, I think it is sort of a near seminal case in the sense that it takes a careful look at the case law that came before it, collects you know 14 factors that are relevant to this determination, the regular and established place of business determination. Uh, it really boils down those 14 to, to the two main factors it thinks are most relevant. 
whether the corporation maintains, controls, and pays for a physical location in the venue, uh, and whether the defendant corporation's representatives work exclusively for the corporation and to what extent the corporation has authorized the reps to do more than merely solicit and forward orders. And again, I, I, don't, I don't think the facts of Hemstreet itself are, are terribly relevant, um, but they found that regular established place of business existed um, in Chicago or in the Northern District of Illinois, um, based on the presence of a district manager who was responsible for sales across nine states uh, in Canada uh, and had a modest amount of sales in the time period. Um, the next two slides uh, collect some cases uh, from the Fifth Circuit. Uh, we fully expect the Eastern District of Texas to be a, a very popular um, place for TC Heartland motions. Um, so I I collected some cases from the Fifth Circuit, both for and against uh, the determination of regular and established place of business um, so that folks can, can harvest these cases and use them as they're thinking about whether, in their cases, um, the, the plaintiff will be able to establish regular and established place of business uh, over their corporation. So with that, I will turn it over to, to Pavan, who's going to address some uh, strategies for plaintiffs after TC Heartland. Thanks very much, Kevin. Um, so sort of starting the second half of this presentation, we want to float into some ideas or things that we think patent owners might try, uh, and depending on who you're representing, you can consider those good or bad, as seeking favorable venue and what some countermeasures uh, defendants that are sued uh, might go ahead and try to take. And we're going to try to do it in uh, three buckets. Um, one is targeting companies outside the United States. Second is dealing with issues in multi-defendant cases. And third is talking a little bit about MDLs in the ITC. And sort of the, the setting of all this is the fact that if you look at products these days, uh, the chain of commerce and sort of all the hands that it goes through throughout the world is amazingly complex. And so it leads it, lends itself to plaintiffs, you know, in to some extent having an ability to sue who they want to sue and then trying to find ways uh, to create damages or, or to come up with damages theories uh, that suit their needs. And so as an example, uh, plaintiffs may want to sue uh, a non-U.S. company manufacturer instead of suing the customer or even the U.S. subsidiary uh, that exists. So, as Kevin mentioned, a lot of his discussion relates to um, Section uh, 1400B and when it comes to defendants that are not in the U.S., and hopefully you can see this on the slide, but it seems that uh, it may not be coming up totally, but there's a quote from Section 1391C3, and 1391 C3 simply uh, provides a defendant not resident in the U.S. may be sued in any judicial district, and the joinder of that defendant is disregarded in determining whether an action may be brought with respect to other defendants. Basically, venue doesn't really matter uh, when it comes to uh, non-U.S. defendants. So it sort of takes venue out of the equation to some extent, if you will. And you know the famous holding or the famous case uh, talking about this and stating that even with respect to patent cases, it doesn't reach suits that are brought against non-U.S. defendants. So at least as of the case of Brunette in 1972 from the Supreme Court, you can, even in a patent case, you're not going to look to Section 1400B. You'll look to what we now know as Section 1391C3. You know, nonetheless, while T.C. Hartland Said they expressly stated that they're not going to decide this issue um, and that, therefore, I suppose one could say brunette at the moment is presumably good law. Maybe, maybe not. Um, perhaps uh, people will make further challenges to determine whether brunette really stands based on the language that exists in the T.C. Hartland case. So with that, trying to think about, you know, whether plaintiffs are going to target non-U.S. Uh, corporations. Let's say they want to just sue in their favored venue A. For example, you might decide to sue the non-U.S. parent corporation instead of the U.S. subsidiary. Well, what can, you know, beyond arguing 
the brunette issue, that is, you know, that venue really should be governed uh, by Section 1400B, what other strategies can a non-U.S. corporation use that's been sued? One is to think about uh, issues such as where the infringing acts are occurring. Section 271 has a number of subsections, as you, everybody knows, some of which really are focused in on the U.S., for example, Section 271A and 271C, um, both of those requiring acts occurring in the United States. There's a little bit of uh, uncertainty around the edges uh, with respect to 271A in terms of selling products, but for the most part, we focus in on, and I should say, using products, for example, systems in the NTT case of years ago. But for the most part, we're talking about activities in the United States for both of those. Section 271B is a little bit different. Um, it doesn't, there seems to be sufficient case law out there that allows somebody to allege that acts occurring outside the U.S. can be deemed to induce infringement, even though those acts uh, don't occur in the U.S. <coughs> and of course, there's always Section 271G relating to the uh, importation of sale of products in the United States, still also one to me that's a little bit more focused on the U.S. But the point is, if the plaintiff is going to be uh, relegated or they have to only argue inducement, there's going to be certain defenses that a defendant can argue in that case. For example, inducement requires uh, knowledge of the patent. Inducement requires knowing that there's infringement. And there's plenty of recent cases that sort of outline the requirements with respect to inducement. But the point is that you have additional defendants, excuse me, additional defenses as somebody who's been sued in that circumstance and, for example, you can cut off past damages if you didn't know about the patent uh, before the lawsuit was brought. So it's not as if a plaintiff can simply choose to sue the non-U.S. defendant without having to worry about geographic issues when it comes to infringement. So that's what I would say is issue number one. A second issue relates to the need for personal jurisdiction. And why don't I turn it over to Leanne to talk a little bit about that. Thanks, Pavan. So as Pavan just said, there is a second challenge to filing suit against the non-US um, corporations, specifically the issues of personal jurisdiction. So typically, um, for suits that are filed against the US corporations, you would just need to show for personal jurisdiction that um, the accused infringing sales are occurring in that state or some other type of commercial activity in the state related to the cause of action. Um, it's going to be different for your non-U.S. corporations, however, because most of those acts may actually occur, most of the acts that they're responsible for may actually occur outside of the U.S. and not actually in the forum state, um, which of course will make it more difficult for the plaintiff patent owner to establish personal jurisdiction over these non-U.S. Um, foreign <clears throat> parent corporations. And of course, this in turn gives those non-U.S. corporations who are brought into suits going forward in order to get favorable venue, it gives them some additional defenses um, <clears throat> towards uh, in, in responding to those cases. And because of this, we thought it would be helpful to just briefly review some of the personal jurisdiction requirements that would apply um, in this situation. So as a refresher, U.S. courts can exercise personal jurisdiction over a company, including a non-U.S. corporation, only when there are minimum contacts that exist between the non-U.S. corporation and the forum state, and where exercising personal jurisdiction over that company will not, um, quote, offend traditional notions of fair play and substantial justice. And this, of course, comes from you know, long-standing Supreme Court precedent. Um, the question of whether there are minimum contacts with the forum state, um, in turn, will depend on what type of, or what theory of jurisdiction is asserted. And so for here, we have general jurisdiction or specific jurisdiction um, that the courts are going to consider. <clears throat> going through those um, very quickly, general jurisdiction, um, would apply when the defendant's contacts with the forum state are so continuous 
and systematic um, to basically make them subject to jurisdiction in that state for any type of cause of action. And so, for example, uh, you know, obviously the state where the company is incorporated or where they have their principal place of business, those are the traditional places where you think of for general jurisdiction. And because of that, um, general jurisdiction typically is not applied in the context of um, lawsuits filed against non-U.S. companies. Um, one example where there was general jurisdiction applied over a non-U.S. Uh, corporation is the 1952 Supreme Court case Perkins um, that we have cited here on this slide. And that was a unique situation where the company, um, I, I believe it was during um, some war, but the, the, the company basically had to move their entire operations outside, I, I believe they were located in the Philippines, um, definitely in Asia, uh, but they had to move their entire operations for a temporary, you know, for a, a short period of time, and they moved it into the U.S., and because of that, the court found that there was sufficient, you know, systematic um, and continuous contacts with that state to render them subject to general jurisdiction. Now, specific jurisdiction is a little bit different, so that would um, apply when the defendant has purposefully directed the activities at residence of the forum, and then the litigation results from those activities or those injuries that arise out of or relate to those activities. And that comes from the Burger King case as well. Now, there were two cases that were actually decided recently by the Supreme Court um, dealing specifically with some issues of jurisdiction, personal jurisdiction over foreign companies. Um, the first one is the Goodyear case. Um, both of these were decided in 2011. Um, the Goodyear case addresses questions of general juris jurisdiction. And briefly, um, what happened here, a lawsuit was filed in North Carolina concerning a bus accident that occurred in Paris um, that involved residents of North Carolina. Um, the plaintiffs claimed that the accident was caused by a defective tire made by Goodyear um, that was actually manufactured by subsidiaries that were located in France, Luxembourg, and Turkey. So the activity all occurred outside of the U.S. Um, the lower courts in, in this case found general jurisdiction over those foreign, foreign companies based on Goodyear generally, their substantial sales and commercial activities within the state. Um, the Supreme Court reversed that decision, said there was no general jurisdiction, even substantial sales and commercial activity in a state does not render a foreign corporation at home in that state. And that language um, where you have to have sufficient activity to render you essentially at home in the state, that's kind of the key takeaway here. Um, the Supreme Court found that otherwise it, it would basically render any large corporation subject to a lawsuit in any state where they sell products. The second case we wanted to cover is the McIntyre case, also from 2011. This one deals with specific jurisdiction. Um, a lawsuit was filed in New Jersey by a resident who was injured using a machine manufactured by McIntyre, who was, uh, which was an English corporation. Um, McIntyre did not have any contact with New Jersey except for the fact that the machine that caused the injury was used in, in New Jersey. And so the machine ended up in the stream of commerce, through the stream of commerce, ended up in New Jersey. So the, case, uh, the Supreme Court in this case addressed this stream of commerce theory of specific jurisdiction. And previously there had been um, a split among the Supreme Court justices in the Asahi Metal case in 1987, um, basically asking the question whether, whether placing a product into the stream of commerce with the expectation that it could end up in a particular state, whether that's enough for specific jurisdiction. So the test was, you know, is it foreseeable that the product could enter the forum? Um, the split related to whether that was enough or whether the defendant must take some additional step that's purposely directed at that forum. Um, the McIntyre uh, Supreme Court they did reverse the lower court's exercise of specific jurisdiction, 
Um, they found that placing a product into the stream of commerce is not enough by itself. There has to be some additional acts. Um, but there are still questions that remain after this case. So we don't know exactly what other steps would be sufficient. And some of the judges um, who concurred in the decision basically were unwilling to endorse a, a new general rule that would apply going forward um, to establish specific jurisdiction in, in these circumstances, particularly in view of the fact that you know, current business practices are so different now from how they were years ago when these cases, when, when some of these issues came up earlier. So with those uncertainties in mind, um, we've you know, given some thoughts to some strategies that non-US corporations can use to challenge personal jurisdiction if they find themselves in a situation where they're being sued in the U.S. courts uh, merely in an attempt to try to get more favorable venue. Um, <coughs> so obviously with this stream of commerce theory now, you know, we know foreseeability alone is no longer sufficient. There must be some other act directed at the forum state. So some of the questions um, that will become relevant here, did the product end up in that state by chance? Or was there a deliberate decision to sell the product in that state? Um, another question that could be relevant is whether the defendant um, directly sells the product to consumers in that forum, or do they sell indirectly through distributors? And if it's indirect sales, what level of control does the defendant have over that distribution? Are they responsible for or making the ultimate decision of where the products are going to end up? Um, depending on where you fit on that line, there may be jurisdiction or not. Um, some other factors to, to consider whether the defendant markets to consumers in that forum state. Um, another factor that the courts have considered is whether the product is specifically designed to address certain needs of customers in that forum. So, you know, for your typical, you know, consumer electronics product, perhaps not, but maybe um, in, in the instance of some special machinery that's used in a particular industry that's Focus in a particular state, you know, maybe that might be the type of, of, of thing that could create a personal jurisdiction. And then finally, the courts may look into whether there are any regular and established channels for addressing service or technical support in that state. So to the extent a, a non-U.S. corporation doesn't have these types of extra facts, uh, Related you know, to the cause of action, it's certainly worth investigating whether there could be a basis for challenging personal jurisdiction. Um, a final, um, her, a third hurdle that we wanted to mention uh, with respect to filing suit against non-U.S. corporations, of course, involves the question of service. Um, the service on a non-U.S. corporation is, is admittedly more difficult than over a U.S. company. Um, typically, it occurs through formal service through the Hague Convention, which can often take many months. Um, because of that, it's often an avenue that patent owners do not want to pursue. Um, they may find themselves doing that more frequently now. Um, and in that respect, we wanted to point out another actually very recent Supreme Court case, the water splash decision from last month, um, essentially holding that service by mail is permissible under the Hague Convention where the receiving state has not objected to service by mail and where it's otherwise authorized um, by the law of the receiving state. And so as just one example, um, Japan and a number of other companies did not, or a number of other countries did not formally object to Article 10A service by mail under the Hague Convention, but there could always be other considerations under that country's um, law that, that a company is going to have to consider. And with that, I'll turn it back to Pavin. So thanks, Leanne. So we spoke a little bit about thinking of the situation where just the non-U.S. corporation is the defendant in the lawsuit and sort of some of the additional hurdles or uh, things for the defendants to consider in defending those lawsuits. There are, of course, other strategies. For example, uh, the U.S. subsidiary of, the, of a non-U.S. parent might go ahead and file a DJ in the favorable venue and then try to get the case transferred. You know, the parent can try to get the case transferred over to that uh, jurisdiction. That's uh, one example. Another may be that the plaintiff starts to play games, or I shouldn't say play games, employs a strategy to sue the non-U.S. Uh, 
a corporate parent in venue A and then the U.S. subsidiary in venue B. I think that's a relatively similar situation where defendants may move to consolidate uh, in venue B, which is more of a home state, if you will, uh, in the U.S. and probably where more of the U.S.-based activities are going to occur, especially if the non-U.S. parent doesn't sell directly into the United States. The plaintiff, uh, on the other hand, may try to move for an MDL in venue A, and the defendants, of course, can uh, either resist the MDL overall and otherwise uh, press for venue B. The, as many of you may know already, MDLs uh, panels under Section 1407, and we'll touch upon this in a moment, they look at certain factors that are listed here in the slide, whether there's common facts, convenience of the parties of witnesses, whether consolidation promotes just and efficient conduct. You know, a sub-factor among those is whether the transferee court, the court that you want to transfer the motion to, has a judge that's qualified or not to handle MD, MDL cases. So defendants there can focus on certain of these factors and argue that really uh, if there's going to be an MDL, which may or may not be the case, and they can consider the different strategies to stretch the plaintiff thin, but if they do say, okay, if there's going to be an MDL, it ought to be uh, in venue B based on really where the witnesses and documents and real U.S. acts uh, are occurring. So another strategy that we're already seeing bantered about a bit is the addition of retailers or distributors. So you may find uh, some of the customers of even whether it's a non-U.S. Uh, corporation or a U.S. subsidiary you know, now we're sort of moving back into the broader realm, you might just, uh, the plaintiff may decide to sue the retailers and distributors and then add uh, the U.S. <coughs> corporation um, to that lawsuit. And in that instance, you know, the plaintiff may say, well, if you look at the concentration of the parties that's in venue B, excuse me, in venue A, defendants can still press for venue B, you know, focusing on things such as the manufacturing and the real sales and the like. Uh, all occurring in the key technology and the documents associated with that and the witnesses associated with that being in venue B. Customers, of course, may also seek to sever their cases uh, and then seek to stay their claims pending the manufacturer claims. Let me speak just for a few minutes because I see, uh, based on the time, I'd like to leave a little bit of time for Leanne to cover uh, what happens in the Hatch-Waxman and biosimilar space. But you can, I think there's a, an understanding and appreciation out there that with a lot of, with respect to a lot of integrated products, you're going to have lots of different defendants. And of course, there's a lot of number of suits uh, throughout the last years, recent years, where you'll sue integrators or customers, if you will, and component suppliers uh, in the same case. And now, you know, based on this ruling uh, for venue, you're going to have to sue each of them in separate jurisdictions. And so two things that plaintiffs may do, one, uh, as I alluded to earlier, is an MDL uh, seeking, you know, focusing in on the lawsuit against certain defendants in venue A and then trying to consolidate all the actions in that venue under Section 1407. Uh, if you just look at the numbers uh, with respect to MDLs, about 50% of those MDLs have been granted in the past couple of years. Uh, now, it's true that not a lot of MDLs are, are in the patent infringement context. And so if you look at the latest numbers, uh, the number of IP cases here is a relatively small slice of the pie. And of course, uh, defendants will make all the arguments that they can with respect to uh, trying to defeat an MDL in that circumstance if they want to strategically. Um, for example, arguing individualized facts among the different defendants, whether it's different products, different infringement issues, the inconvenience of a number of parties and witnesses, for example, to a jurisdiction uh, that the plaintiff really wants to be in, and then maybe even arguing that the various proceedings are at different stages. Despite all that, we do expect uh, an increase in the number of MDL actions uh, in the coming years. Another strategy that plaintiffs uh, are likely to employ is increasing the number of ITC cases, or International Trade Commission cases. Of course, there's a requirement that you've got to show importation and there are some additional things, uh, the most important of which is that the complainant, and the ITC is called a complainant rather than a plaintiff, needs to establish a domestic industry. So there's a bit more upfront work and some additional requirements 
uh, that plaintiffs need to show. At the same time, ITC cases move uh, awfully fast, and you can get a leg up and try to sue a number of defendants, and getting a stay of an ITC case, uh, as I understand, seems to be a nearly, I'll just say, extremely difficult, um, for example, pending a post-grant proceeding at the USPTO. Why don't we let the last few minutes Leanne address uh, the pharma industry and the impact that TC Heartland may have on it. Thanks, Pavan. Um, so I, th I think the critical thing to look at for the impact for, for how TC Heartland is going to impact Hatch-Waxman and biosimilar cases is going to deal with the question of where do these infringing acts take place. So of course, um, these cases are filed before there actually is a commercial product sold on the market. Um, so that is going to raise unique questions about what is the act of infringement. Um, there's also a few other uh, things that we'll talk about in terms of uh, multiple defendant lawsuits and how likely there will be any venue challenges. Um, in terms of looking to where the act of infringement has occurred, uh, we, th we think that the disputes will likely focus on whether the venue analysis should be forward-looking, perspective, in terms of where the products are likely to be sold. Um, as opposed to whether we're limited to looking just at actual acts that have occurred. Um, so in this respect, I, I think what's happened in the last couple of years on the whole fight over personal jurisdiction is going to be somewhat instructive. And, and there, of course, we know that the Federal Circuit and the Accorda decision in 2016 came down on the side of, of the forward-looking analysis being appropriate. So in that case, it was um, the, the Delaware court. Uh, or in that case, there was jurisdiction over Milan in Delaware because of the, the, the fact that Milan was likely to sell its products in Delaware once they went on the market. Um, some other things that, that the courts have looked at traditionally that could form the basis for an active infringement in the Hatch-Waxman context include um, the development and testing of the generic product or the biosimilar product. Um, preparation of the ANDA or the ABLA for submission to the FDA, and then mailing of the Paragraph 4 notice letter or the confidential materials to the um, reference uh, sponsor on the, for the patent dance. Um, the things that we need to be careful about here, though, which I think are going to be unique in the venue context, is the fact that most of those activities that occur um, are actually exempted from infringement under 271E2. So even though they may have been sufficient for personal jurisdiction, they may not be for venue given the fact that it, it's not actually an act of infringement. It's, it's exempted from infringement under the statute. Um, and then, of course, you know, most Hatch-Waxman cases, they're, fall, they're filed in New Jersey and Delaware. Um, a lot of them involve uh, multiple filers at the same time. Um, there's efficiencies for both sides in consolidating these cases. Uh, the judges in, in New Jersey and Delaware are very familiar with the specific issues that come up. Um, and, and so to the extent it's going to be difficult to get your or venue over all of the cases, especially in these multiple generic cases, um, we, again, may see a rise in multi-district litigation. Um, we probably will expect to see another round of protective suits being filed, just like we did with the personal jurisdiction issues until this is resolved. And then lastly, you know, th th there may actually be a question about whether the defendants are even going to want to challenge venue going forward. Um, some generic defendants uh, likely and, and certainly are, are probably going to prefer litigating in their home state. Um, others may perceive an advantage of being by themselves in another quicker forum, possibly to get a non-infringement ruling before their other competitors. Um, but some other generic defendants may decide to forego venue challenges at all um, because it will delay resolution of the case, possibly beyond the 30-month stay. And other defendants may prefer to stay in New Jersey or Delaware um, and, and the option of being consolidated with their other generic filers just to achieve some cost efficiencies. So with that, I think we are right um, at, the, at the end of the hour. Um, we do, so I think we'll stop here with our presentation. Um, we do have some additional slides that are in the materials um, at the, immediately following these with some statistics on some new and recent filings, where those cases are being filed after TC Heartland. 
And then we also have an appendix of slides, which is some additional information that we didn't think we were going to be able to cover. Um, so hopefully that will be helpful to all of you. <coughs> um, we want to, of course, thank Allison Jones and Mayumi Willie, um, and, and also uh, with the assistance of Delia Dye for helping us put this on together. Um, we will address, um, we'll, we'll, we'll try to address the questions by email um, since we didn't have time to deal with that on the call. And then as a quick reminder, um, there will be a survey that will come up at the end, and we would appreciate it if you have a few minutes to give us your feedback. And thank you all for attending. Thanks again.